death lurks in the shadows of time, often striking quickly without warning, sometimes tugging slowly at life. In our grief and sense of loss, we naturally desire to see our loved ones again. Is there only a thin veil that separates the living from the dead? Can the spirits of the deceased cross Mom? over into our world Mom, to give us guidance you? and comfort in this life? Yes, sweet darling, it's me. I've been watching over you, honey, and I see that you're going In to the sacred really pages of God's Word, the truth about this mystery is revealed. Join us as seminar speaker Steve Orberg presents Deadly Delusions About Death and Hell. And now the feature presentation, 1,000 Years and the Lake of Fire. We are continuing a little mini-series here dealing with the mysterious topic of death, and eventually we'll get to hell, the topic of hell. That'll be my next meeting, the hot topic of hell. The first meeting we talked about, should we talk to the dead, and showed from the Bible, what's the answer to that question? No, right, definitely not. Uh, then the next meeting that I held, we talked about, uh, can the dead talk at all? And what's the answer to that question? No, right, no again, the dead cannot talk. The Bible's very clear on that. And so now we're gonna move into prophecy, shift into the book of Revelation, chapter 20, and talk about the thousand years, which does tie in with the subject of death. This will be very clear as we go along, and this is a very powerful meaning, very enlightening. So let's bow our heads and let's begin with prayer, and we'll launch right in to this uh, tremendous topic. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray that you will help us. Please guide me, guide my lips, guide my mind. And as we get into your book, may it be very clear, very simple, and very powerful. May we all see uh, that we need Jesus desperately in our lives every day, forever. We need him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. 1,000 years and the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 is the chapter in the Bible that talks about the 1,000 years. And let's start from the top. Chapter 20, verse 1, the Bible says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. John said, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? For a thousand years, right there, it talks about the thousand year period. Verse three says, the angel cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should do what? Deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Uh, based on this text, these first three verses, uh, sometimes I like to say that one of these days, the devil is going on a long vacation on a thousand year vacation when he will not be able to deceive anybody during that time. Now, we're not in the millennium yet. We're not in the thousand years yet. And so the devil's not on vacation yet. And according to this verse, uh, how many people is he deceiving? It says he's deceiving nations because during the thousand years he can deceive the nations no more. But he's not on vacation yet. He's still deceiving nations. And I have a funny feeling he'd like to deceive people about the thousand year subject. So we're going to study this very carefully uh, right now from our Bible to see what it actually says. Now here's just a little, my little mini chart here, the thousand years. Again, it's only mentioned in one chapter in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 20. It talks about what happens at the beginning, what happens at the, in the middle, and what happens at the end of the thousand years. So where do you think we should start in our study today? Start at the beginning, right. That's the best place to start. So let's go to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that has a part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So here the topic of death is connected to the thousand years. And this is obviously talking about the good resurrection. This is a blessed resurrection. The Bible says, Blessed and holy are those that have a part in the first resurrection. And it says these people will uh, live with Christ, they will reign with him for a thousand years. So there's the first resurrection. This is the resurrection of the dead in Christ, of the believers. They come up and it says they reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Now, this, this text is very clear. There is a first resurrection. And if there's a first resurrection, what does that imply? 
There would be a second, that's right, a second resurrection. And this will become very clear as we get farther into this meeting that the first resurrection, as verse 6 tells us, takes place at the beginning of the thousand years. And the second resurrection takes place at the end of the thousand years. And the thousand years is really a period of time in between these two resurrections. And this will get uh, clearer as we go along. Now, what event brings about the first resurrection of the blessed and the holy who come up uh, in that resurrection? What event brings this about? That's right. You've got it. It's the return of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. This was the text that we ended with in our last meeting. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is very clear. Paul talks about Jesus coming and about the resurrection of the dead, the good resurrection. 4.16, the Bible says that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump or the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ. There it is, the good resurrection. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Hallelujah. And if I do die before Jesus comes, I want to be in this resurrection. Don't you? Amen. All right. Verse 17 says, Then we who are alive and remain, I think this will be our preference to be alive at that time, shall be caught up together with them, with those that are raised in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And these words are powerful. These words are pointing forward to the, the physical, bodily, literal, literal return of Jesus Christ He's going to raise the dead. That's the first resurrection. He's going to catch up the living. And we are, according to this verse, are going to be with him forever. Always. Hallelujah. Now, as you look carefully at this verse, in verse 17, it doesn't say that Jesus comes down and stays down here at this point. It says that we go up, doesn't it? He's going to come down and get us and take us up. And this is at the beginning of the thousand years because this is what brings about the first resurrection. Now what, uh, or maybe I should say where, when he picks us up and takes us up, where do we go? Where are we going? Uh, there's a picture there, and I don't know exactly what the New Jerusalem completely looks like. Revelation 21 describes it. There are a few other places where we get a little glimmer of what it's going to be like, but no, no slide or no human imagination can really picture the glory of the place that Jesus is preparing for us and that he is going to take us to. We looked at these verses earlier in, in one of the previous meetings. Uh, Jesus said there in John 14, verse 2, he said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, for you personally and for me personally. He's up there now. That's what he's doing. And then verse 3, John 14, 3, Jesus says, I will come again. I will come back again. That's what we just read. He's going to come back. He's going to get us. He's going to resurrect the dead in Christ. He's going to catch up the living, and he's going to pick us up, and we're going to meet him in the air. And then it says, he will receive us to himself that where he is, Jesus says, that's where we're going to be. Where I am, there you shall be also. Now, where is he now? He's up there in heaven, in the New Jerusalem, and he says clearly in this passage, he's going to come back, he's going to get us, he's going to pick us up, he's going to receive us, and he's going to take us to be with him where he is. And so, based upon these verses in Revelation 26, that there's a resurrection, and then the people reign with Christ a thousand years, those that are in that resurrection, and 1 Thessalonians 4, that that resurrection occurs when Jesus comes to get us, and he picks us up, and we meet him in the air, based upon these verses, and comparing them with John 14, 2 and 3, it's very clear to me that when he comes down to get us and take us up, we're going up there to the New Jerusalem, to the mansions that he's preparing for us, and that's where we're going to be. And, and I know, because I, I know enough about the Lord based upon my reading of the Bible and what I know of God's heart, that God wants everybody to go up and to be with him. I mean, that's his, that's his desire. That's the desire of his heart. He's the father uh, of all. He loves everyone, black, white, Whatever religion we're of, whatever country we're a part of or grew up in, uh, God wants all of us to be there. But if we know the Bible like we should, we know that it's not going to be that way, that not everybody's going. Even though God wants everyone to go, even though God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not everybody is going up. 
when Jesus comes down to take us home. So next question is, what happens to those that don't go up? Go back to your Bible, keep reading, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, right on, right after Paul talked about the return of Christ, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul continued and said, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, this day when Jesus comes down, this day will come like a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then what will happen to them? Paul said, sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So at the end of chapter 4, it talks about what happens when Jesus comes and he picks up those that are ready. They go up. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, it talks about what happens to those who do not go up. And Paul is very clear, and there's the text right there. He said they will experience sudden destruction and they will not escape. Now, how widespread is this destruction? Uh, how, how widespread, or maybe I should say it this way, uh, w the people that Jesus picks up, are they only in one part of the world or are they all over the world? They're all over the world. The dead in Christ are all over the world. The people that are, are his living saints, they're all over the world. And they're going to be picked up and taken up to heaven all over this planet. And there's going to be people all over the world that aren't in that group, that aren't ready, that aren't prepared for Jesus to come. And Paul says in this passage, sudden destruction will come upon them. Now, how widespread and how uh, total will this destruction be? Well, let's look at a couple of other verses. Let's go to Luke chapter 17, and let's take a look. These are not pretty verses. I'd rather just look at the verses that talk about the Lord taking us up. Those are the nice verses. Those are the good verses, the positive verses. But the other verses are there too, and we need to look at them both. We need to look at them all. Luke chapter 17. How widespread is the destruction when Jesus comes? Well, let's find out. Luke 17, if you look at verse 26, Jesus talks about his coming, and he compares it to the day of Noah. Verse 26, Luke 17, 26, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. For they did eat, they, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed how many people? The flood came and destroyed them all. How widespread was the flood? It was all over the world, that's right. And only uh, those that were in the ark were protected, but all the other people, uh, the Bible says it destroyed them all. Now go down to the next verse. Verse 28, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed how many of them? Destroyed them all, everybody that didn't get out of, of Sodom. Now notice verse 30. Verse 30, Jesus says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now this is very clear. To me it's as clear as uh, sunlight. Jesus said, just like Noah's day, the flood came and destroyed them all. Just like Lot's day, the fire came down and destroyed them all. He said, it's going to be exactly the same way when he comes. That's what the Lord said, right? It's his words, not mine. Now go to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation 19. There are many passages that teach, teach this, but we're not going to look up them all. We just don't have time. But this one is also very clear. Revelation chapter 19 describes the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ in verses 11 to 16. And if you look at verse 17, right after he comes, Revelation 19, 17, John said, I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit upon them, and the flesh of how many people? It says the flesh of all men, right, both free and bond, both small and great. I know this is a rather ghastly slide, 
but it illustrates what this verse is saying, that after Jesus comes, it says there's going to be a big supper of the birds, and the supper of the birds is going to eat the flesh of all the people all over planet Earth who do not go up when Jesus comes. Now, if you read this chapter carefully, uh, chapter 19 of Revelation, there's actually two suppers. This is the bad supper, the supper of the birds for those that are left down here. In verse 9, it talks about those that are up there who are eating the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where the saints sit down at the table and they eat all the good food that the Lord is uh, preparing for us. So there's two suppers, the supper of the birds and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if you put it together, basically what Revelation 19 is saying is that we have a choice. We're either going to be up there in heaven with Jesus eating the supper, or we're going to be down here and we're going to be the supper. Now, if you look at those options, I mean, which one sounds better to you? I think it should be pretty clear, hopefully, and I think God gives us this very graphic illustration to inspire us to make sure that we're on his side and that we're up there. I don't want to be down here, uh, the supper for the birds. And this is part of the price, not all of the price, but it is part of the price of being deceived by the devil, by the serpent. Now consequences are coming at the end of the world. Go to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 26 is an awesome section. And this talks about what the earth will be like after Jesus comes, after the supper of the birds, after it's like Noah's day, after, it was, uh, after it'll be like Lot's day, just like Jesus said. Jeremiah looked into the future. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 through 26. Jeremiah had a vision, he looked into the future, and he said, I beheld the earth. He saw the whole earth, and lo, it was without form, and it was void, and the heavens, and they had no light, no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. When you read Revelation 16 at the end of that chapter, it talks about a huge earthquake that's never been seen before, and the cities crumbling around the world, and these are just probably the aftershocks of that big earthquake. Uh, they, the mountains trembled, the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, how many people were there? Now he saw the whole earth, and he said, there was no man, no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. That's after the supper of the birds. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. When Jesus comes down from heaven with a shout, with a voice, with a trumpet, raising the dead in Christ and picking up the living and taking us up there, this is showing us what's going to happen as a result of the presence of the Lord coming down to this planet and what happens to those who do not go up. This text is very clear. Jeremiah 4.25 says, how many people were left? Not a one. Jeremiah said there was no man left alive on planet Earth. And he saw the whole Earth. That's what this is talking about. In other words, those that do not go up when Jesus comes, they will not survive. Just like Noah's day, the flood came and destroyed them all. Just like Lot's day, the fire came down, destroyed them all. Just like Revelation 19 says, the supper of the birds, they come and eat the flesh of everybody. Here, Jeremiah 4, verse 25 says that there's not a person left. And just like Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, two and three, he said, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, he said they will experience sudden destruction and they will not escape. Now, I know that's a rather uh, sober thought. It is a very sober thought to think about, but that's, that's what the Bible says. In other words, just to make it real simple and plain, those that do not go up, they don't survive. There will be no human survivors on planet Earth who can get through the second coming and not go up, uh, that's, that's it for them, at least at that point. And planet Earth is going to be depopulated just like it was in the days of Noah, except for those that were in the ark. Now, this slide is a summary so far of what we've just read right there in the Bible. We saw it very plainly. At the beginning of the thousand years, Jesus comes down from heaven. 
And that's when he resurrects the dead in Christ. This is the good resurrection of the blessed and the holy who come up to reign with him for a thousand years. All the saved are caught up. Those that have been raised and those that are, are alive were all caught up to get out of here and to go up there to be with him. Sudden destruction comes, comes upon all those that don't go up and planet Earth is depopulated. And that's really what the Bible says. I know this may sound different from what a lot of people teach and what a lot of people uh, believe, but that is really, really what this book says. I've studied this for a long, long time. I had a minister come once to uh, this particular talk that I've given before from a different church than I go to. And when we were done, at the end of that meeting, he shook my hand at the door and he said, uh, Steve, he said, I have never understood this topic in my whole life until today, till now. And I'm thankful for that. And I hope that as we go along, that when we're done, this will be very, very clear, very simple. And it's just right there. It's right in the Bible. Now, as I mentioned, there, there will be no human survivors after Jesus comes, but there will be survivors. Let me clarify that. No human survivors, but there will be survivors. Uh, the devil is not human, and he survives the second coming, and so do his angels. Let's go back to Revelation, the last verse in chapter 19. Satan goes through this. Revelation chapter 19, the last verse, and then we'll go to chapter 20. At the end of Revelation 19, it talks again about the destruction that takes place when Jesus comes at his second coming. Verse 21 says, The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So there again is the supper of the birds described at the end of chapter 19. The supper of the birds there. All the fowls are filled with their flesh. Now, go down to chapter 20. Verse 1, John continues right on. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive, who? The nations no more. Right, he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So the Bible says clearly that uh, during the thousand years, Satan, who is still alive, can't deceive anybody. He doesn't deceive the nations. Now, wh why would you say that is? Why is it that Satan can't deceive the nations during the thousand years? based on what we just read and at the end of chapter 19. That's right. You can see it. It's because there are no nations on planet Earth. It's because they're all dead. And Satan can't deceive people that are dead. They're, they're uh, in the grave, and Satan is left with his angels just to wander around planet Earth and to meditate and think about what's going to happen to them at the end of the thousand years. I definitely would not want to be the devil at that time. I wouldn't want to be the devil at any time, but definitely not during that time. Uh, that's not going to be, you know, you've heard the phrase, are we having fun yet? Satan is not going to be having any fun during, during the millennium. Now, I know that the common view on this topic, and I'm well aware of this, the common view about the thousand years that most people believe, most churches teach, is that uh, during the thousand years, the devil has gone somewhere and the nations are here on earth uh, living in peace for a millennial, the millennial reign on earth. That is the common view. Now, I want to just try to shed some light on this. Uh, the, the thousand year period is only mentioned in one chapter in the Bible, specifically. It's only in chapter 20 of Revelation. That's it. I've studied this for many, many years. I know this chapter backwards and forwards. I can probably quote it uh, if I prayed and, and you know, had all my memory with me, I could just recite it from top to bottom. I know this chapter very well, and I can promise you that nowhere in Revelation chapter 20 does it say anywhere that the nations are on earth reigning in peace with Jesus during the thousand years. It is just not there. Now, I will show you a verse that does talk about the nations 
uh, on earth, and that's in verse 8, and we'll get to that, but it doesn't say they're on earth during the thousand years. Now, let's go back to verse 3, and I want to take you uh, carefully into the third verse. Verse 3 is extremely important. You just have to look at it carefully with a magnifying glass and put the pieces together. Verse 3 says that the angel cast the devil into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Now, I've got my little chart here to help illustrate this. And this is exactly what it says. Notice. He deceives the nations no more until the thousand years are finished. Is that right? That's what it says. Now, here's the millennial period. It says he deceives the nations no more during the thousand years. So if he doesn't deceive them during the thousand years, then what does that imply he's doing before the thousand years? Deceiving the nations, right. And if you carefully look at this verse, these nations are all the devil's nations. They're Satan's nations. They're not God's nations. They're not on God's side. Uh, he deceives them before the thousand years. During the thousand years, he can't deceive them anymore, and why not? Because they're dead, right? But then it says, until the thousand years are finished, which means that at the end of the thousand years, then Satan goes back and deceives those very nations. And that's what it actually says in Revelation 20, verse 7, that he goes right back into those same nations and deceives them. So these are Satan's nations. They're all the devil's nations. Prior to the millennium, he's deceiving them now. During the thousand years, he can't deceive them because they're dead. At the end of the thousand years, he goes right back into them and he deceives them again. And I'll show you in just a few minutes that the reason why he can deceive them at the end of the thousand years is because something happens. If there's a first resurrection, what else is there? A second resurrection, that's right. And I'll prove to you in just a few moments that they are resurrected at the end of the thousand years and that's the reason why Satan is able to go in and to deceive them. Now, verse 1 tells us that Satan is bound in a place called the bottomless pit. If you do some study on the word pit in any concordance, in the Old Testament, especially Isaiah 24, many verses in the book of Psalms, you'll find that the word pit is actually a word that the Bible uses to apply to the grave to apply to a cemetery. Uh, David prayed, he said, Lord, keep me alive, lest I go down into the pit. And there's lots of verses like that. And basically what the Bible is saying is that the whole planet is like one big pit, one big bottomless pit, one big gigantic cemetery. And it says also in verse 1 that Satan is bound with a chain, a great chain. Now, this is not a, a literal chain because if you were to put the devil's wrists in a literal chain, I mean, what would he do? He'd slip out because he's a spirit being. He's, he's invisible. Uh, you can't bind him with, with a literal chain. There's some symbolism in here. Have you ever had anybody say, um, I'd like to help you, but I can't because my hands are tied. I wish I could, but I can't. Now, when they say my hands are tied, I can't do anything for you, do, do, do they mean that their hands are literally tied? No, they mean that this is a, a figure of speech that they just, you know, circumstances are preventing them from helping you. And it's the same thing with the devil. Uh, his hands are tied. He is in the bottomless pit, planet Earth, a big cemetery, and a chain of circumstances has prevented him from deceiving anybody anymore during that time because all the people are dead. So he's stuck and there's nothing he can do but sit there with his hand on his chin and just think, you know, what a... What a nightmare for him. And he deserves a few nightmares. And he's got more nightmares coming at the end of the thousand years. Now, somebody once said, tongue in cheek, that the devil is the best pastor that ever lived. And the reason is because he visits his church members every day. Can you believe that? Yeah, well, guess what? During the thousand years, Satan can't uh, visit any church members because he doesn't have any church members because they're all dead and that's just where he is. He is stuck, stuck here. Now, where are we at that time? Are we going to be down here on planet Earth? Obviously not. Where did we learn when Jesus comes to get us, where is he taking us? He's taking us up there to the new Jerusalem, to the place he's preparing for us. That's what he said. Revelation 21 is all about the new Jerusalem, this beautiful place. And that's where we are going to be with him up there 
during the 1,000 years. Now, let me give you a summary of what we've learned so far happens during the 1,000 years. We've looked at the beginning, now we're in the middle. During the 1,000 years, planet Earth is desolate, it's depopulated, there's no man, it's like a bottomless pit, a big cemetery. Uh, Satan is bound on this Earth by a chain of circumstances, his hands are tied, he can't deceive anybody, the nations are dead, and all of the saved are up there in heaven with Jesus for the 1,000 years. All right, now what happens at the end of the 1,000 years? Now we're moving in to the climax. Moving into the climax, take a look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, and then we'll go back to chapter 20. Revelation mentions many times that the new Jerusalem, which is where we're going to be during the thousand years, and where we're going to live in forever, is actually a city that is up in heaven, but it's not going to be staying up there forever. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, talks about those that overcome the devil. Jesus said, him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go no more out. I will write upon him the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So Jesus tells us in this verse that the new Jerusalem, what's going to happen to it? It's going to come down. That's what he says right there in verse 12. The new Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven. It says the same thing in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. It says the same thing in Revelation 21, verse 10, that the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. Now let's go back to chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And the saints are going to be in it. The saints are going to be in the new Jerusalem at the end of the thousand years when it comes down to the earth. All right, we've already read Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Satan is bound. Verses 4 through 6, 4, 5, and 6, actually talk about uh, those that have died for Jesus and those that are resurrected in the good resurrection. At the end of verse 4, it says they reign with Christ. They live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 6 talks about the first resurrection, same resurrection. Now, in the first part of verse 5, Revelation 20, verse 5, is actually a little parenthesis. Verses 4 to 6 is talking about the first resurrection, but there's a little parenthesis at the beginning of verse 5, and look at it closely. It says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. God's people are resurrected in the first resurrection to reign with Christ for a thousand years up there in the New Jerusalem. The rest of the dead who aren't resurrected in that first resurrection, the Bible is very clear that they come up. When do they come up? When the thousand years are finished. And there it is right there. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And then it, the rest of verse 5 goes back to talking about the first resurrection, verse 6 talks about the first resurrection. Now, I heard about a woman once that had a dream. Now, I don't believe that all dreams are inspired by God. Sometimes if you uh, eat too much pizza before you go to bed, you might dream up a storm. Some dreams come from the devil. Some dreams do come from God. And I heard about a lady who had a dream, and I think it did come from God because it fits with the Bible. Well, anyway, here was the dream. This woman, in her dream, she dreamed there was a very tall man who looked like an angel and he was digging a grave. And she uh, looked at him digging this grave, and then she asked him, she said, who is that grave for? And the tall man looked at her and said, this grave is for you and for your mother and your children. And the woman thought about it in her dream, and she looked at the man and she said, would you mind digging separate graves for us? And the uh, tall man said, okay. So he dug separate graves. And then the scene changed in the dream, and all of a sudden there was a big earthquake, there was a, a loud trumpet blast, there was a shaking sound, and third person, she looked and she saw herself come out of one grave, her mother come out of another grave, and then her kids coming out of other graves, uh, one by one. And she looked at the tall man, and the tall man said, this is the return of Jesus. This is the return of Jesus Christ. And she's watching this, you know, seeing herself and her family coming up out of the graves. Hallelujah. You know, great dream. And then as she looked farther down the line, she saw that there were other graves that didn't open up. 
when the trumpet sounded and the graves were opening. They didn't open up. And she looked at the tall man and she said, what about those graves? What's going to happen with those graves? And the tall man looked at her very solemnly and he said, those graves will open up at the end of the 1,000 years. Wow. And uh, there's a woman that I know that heard this dream from a lady that she was studying the Bible with, and, and she told me what this dream was, and I thought, you know, that fits. That fits the Bible. It's a solemn dream, but it fits, and it fits right with that verse right there that you see, Revelation 20, verse 5, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. All right, let's go back to our Bibles and let's keep reading. We've got more to do. We're not done yet with this topic. We've got to move to the climax. Revelation chapter 20, notice verse 7. 27. The Bible says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So there's very clear that the devil is loosed at the end of the thousand years. Now, if you've had any question, or maybe you're not sure if what I'm telling you is really right, just uh, look at these two verses, put them together, and there they are right there on the screen. Revelation 20, verse 5 says, The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So we know that at the end of the thousand years, there's a resurrection. Correct? Is that true? Is that what the Bible says? Right there. And then we look at chapter 20, verse 7. And it says, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So at the, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed. Is that what the Bible says? Right there in the Bible. Now notice, two things happen at the same time. One event is the resurrection of the rest of the dead. The second event is the loosing of the devil. And if you put them right together, what is it that looses the devil? It's the resurrection of the rest of the dead. See, they're raised, and so he's loosed to go in and deceive them. Now, if the uh, resurrection of the lost, this is the rest of the dead, if that's what looses the devil, then what would be the thing that binds the devil? The destruction of those nations, right? They're, they're uh, killed at the second coming, Satan's bound. At the end of the thousand years, they're resurrected, Satan is loosed loosed. It's really clear. I know this is different from what a lot of people teach, but it's right there. And I've decided as a Christian, ever since I first started reading the Bible, I've decided I cannot go along with majority opinion. I can't go along with just what everybody's saying and what's popular. I've got to stick to the book. I don't want to be one of those people that are, that are deceived by the devil, waking up at the end of the thousand years, and then realizing I'm wrong, right? I want to know uh, if I'm wrong now, and correct myself by the Bible and follow the book no matter what. Sound good? We can't afford to take any chances. We've got to make sure we know where we are and whose side, whose side we're on. All right, let's go back to the Bible and see what happens. At the end of verse 7, we'll just read verse 7 again. When the thousand years are expired, Satan is loosed out of his prison. And then it says, he goes out to deceive the nations. Right out, goes right out to those nations to deceive them which are in the four quarters of the earth. They're all over the world. Now, does it say that they, they were in the four quarters of the earth, all those nations there during the thousand years? It doesn't say that. It says they're there at the end of the thousand years. Now, how did they get there? They're resurrected. That's the key right there. They're raised, as verse 5 says, then Satan goes out, to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Wow. There are going to be more people than can be counted. John just saw this in vision, and he said that the number of those that are resurrected at the end of the thousand years, the number of the lost, the ones that Satan goes into to, to deceive, he said their number is like the sand of the sea. In other words, there's millions and millions and millions and billions of them. Satan has been deceiving them. He can't deceive them during the millennium. At the end of the millennium, they're resurrected. He goes right back in, and he starts deceiving them again. Uh, the first program of this little mini-seminar, I showed you this picture from today's issue of People magazine. 
and it, here's this smiling man, and it says, they see dead people. We talked about this the first program, should we talk to the dead? And all the people now that are out there thinking that they can communicate with the dead, talk to the dead, uh, the spirits that are out there that are appearing, they think they're the spirits of the dead. Are they really the spirits of the dead? We learned the first program, God forbids us to talk to the dead. We learned the second program about can the dead talk at all, that they're silent in the grave, they don't know anything, they're sleeping waiting for the resurrection. And so who are these people when it says they see dead people? Who are the dead people, the dead ghosts, the dead spirits that come to people in their homes that they think are the spirits of the dead? They're demons, that's right, they're the devil and his angels. And this is just one of many, many uh, tricks and deceptions and delusions of Satan to get people to listen to his voice, to follow him, so that they're not following God's voice, following the Bible, so that they'll be resurrected at the end of the thousand years, and they'll be in that group that can't even be counted, like the sand of the sea, billions and billions of billions of them on the wrong side at the end of time. That's a very sober thought, and this is just one of, of many, many deceptions. What's happening here is God is describing a time when every single human being who is lost throughout history, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world, they're all resurrected and they're all there at one, one moment. One moment. It's an awesome thing. The entire human race is going to be there. Everybody is going to be alive at one time. Now go, go back to your Bibles and look at verse 9. Revelation 20, we already read in verse 8 that they're being gathered together for a battle. Satan gathers all these people who are resurrected. They're his people. He moves them for a battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9 says, they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed, they're walking across the earth, and they compassed or surround the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Satan gathers all these nations to surround the camp of God's people, the camp of the saints, and it's called the beloved city. Now, what's another name for that city? The New Jerusalem, that's right. And where are God's people? They're inside of it. That's why it's called the camp of the saints, the camp of the saints. And that's where we are. We're with Jesus in the New Jerusalem during the thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, that city comes down. We're in it. When it sits upon the earth, then the rest of the people are raised. Satan goes into them and gathers them all around the city, and he deceives them into thinking that they can take the city by storm. They can break down the gates of the New Jerusalem. They can conquer God's city. Is that a delusion or what? Satan knows he can't do it, but he, he convinces these people. And if you think about it, what's happening here, at that moment, every single human being who has ever lived is alive at one time. All the lost are outside the city with the devil and his angels. All the saved are inside the city with Jesus Christ. And I want to be inside, not outside. Don't you? And that's the moment when everybody's there. Everybody there is at one, one point in time. Wow. And it says in verse 9, Revelation 20, verse 9, that when they surround the camp of the saints about, it finally says that fire came down from God out of heaven and did what to them? It said it devoured them. And we will pick up on this subject and we'll study this verse and also verse 10 in our next meeting tomorrow. We've got one more meeting with me called the Hot Topic of Hell. And we will get into that, that subject. But let's just go on a little bit more here. If you go down to verse 11, verse 11 backs up and describes a judgment taking place before the fire falls. Verse 11 says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the, face the earth and the heaven had fled away and there was found no place for them. So all of a sudden, all these people are there. They're around the city. Satan has convinced them that they can conquer the city, break down the gates of the new Jerusalem. And before the fire falls, all of a sudden they look up and they see a, a great white throne. And it is the judgment day. It is the great white throne throne judgment of all the lost. Now, the saved are not judged here. Uh, these are, this is only a judgment of the lost at the end of the thousand years. If you go down to the next verse, 
Verse 12, it says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Now, the, here it is, their resurrection again, describing the resurrection. The dead are now standing before God. And the books, it says, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So what this, what this uh, chapter does here is it backs up before the fire falls, describes a great white throne, describes all these people standing before God, and then it describes books being opened, and it says that they're judged according to the things which are written in the book. Verse 13 says the same thing. Verse 13 describes the resurrection again and says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. Uh, there are people like Hitler who has done just a incredible, horrible, terrible things, and then he took a gun and he shot himself, and that was it. But that's not enough. I mean, that's not it. Hitler is going to be resurrected at the end of the thousand years. He's going to stand before God, and that's when he answers to his maker for all the things that he has uh, committed in this life, which he never, as far as we know, uh, repented of. I mean, he killed himself when he realized that it was, uh, he, he lost the war. The Allies were moving in, and that was it. And it's going to be the same way with, with all the people that have been lost, that have done all kinds of terrible things, that have hurt people and caused suffering. Uh, when they die, it's, it's not over. It's not over. They are resurrected because they have to stand before God. They have to become accountable for their whole lives. And that's when they receive the punishment that they deserve for their actions. That's the time of accountability. That's the time when justice kicks in for the whole world, for all, all of the lost. Uh, it's just an awesome, awesome thing. And I believe strongly that when that time finally comes, and when all the nations of all the people from, from Cain who killed Abel, who as far as we know probably was on the wrong side, uh, the New Testament says that Cain was of the evil one, all the way down to the very end, to the last human being at the second coming of Christ. When they're all resurrected, all the lost, and they stand before God and the books are opened and they see the record of their whole lives flash in front of their eyes, every, every opportunity that they've ever had to come to God is going to flash in front of them. Every time that they've heard a sermon from a minister appealing to them, pleading with them to come to Jesus, but they didn't accept that, they didn't respond, that's going to flash in front, of, in front of their eyes. Every time that anybody ever witnessed to them or talked to them about God, every mother's prayers, whatever has happened in a person's life where God has tried over and over and over and over again to reach out to them, to get a hold of them, to bring them to Him, if they've said no, 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 that's going to flash in front of them right before their eyes. And in the midst of all of this, as they look at their whole lives, I believe strongly, strongly that God is going to give them a revelation of Jesus Christ, a revelation of His love. They're probably going to see the whole story of the life of Christ, from Bethlehem through His uh, baptism, His parables, His teachings, His healings, His love, His sufferings in Gethsemane, His trials, His beatings, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, the Holy Spirit coming to them and pleading with them, come to Jesus. He loves you. He gave everything for you. And they're going to see all that. And they're going to realize at one horrible moment that God was there, that he's real, that he loves them. He loved them. He gave everything for them. He gave his son for them. He didn't want them to be on the outside. He wanted them to be on the inside. But they have chosen over and over and over and over again, instead of following this book, instead of following the truth, they have followed lies, they follow deceptions like this, People Magazine, that says they see dead people. This is a lie. This is a delusion. And what's going to happen at the end of the thousand years is all the delusions that have ever hit, people's eyes are going to be open, and they're going to realize they've been deceived, they've been duped, they're lost, and at this point, it's going to be too late. It's too late. You can't uh, switch sides at the end of the thousand years. Now's the time to switch sides, right? Now's the time because there's no switching back then or, or at that time. 
And they're going to realize Jesus loved them. He died for them, but it's too late. It is too late. It's going to be an awesome, awesome thing. It's going to be an awful moment. And, and I believe that Jesus is going to look at the lost with tears in his eyes. He's going to look at the whole world because he loves them. He loves every single person. He died for the whole world, the sins of the whole world. He's going to look at them all. And with tears in his eyes, Jesus Christ himself, the supreme judge, is going to put the gavel down and he's going to say, you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. There's no blood available to cleanse you. There's no grace available now to save you. There's no forgiveness now available. You've rejected it. It's too late. It's all over. You're guilty. And there's nothing more that God can do. Nothing more that he can do. Wow. If you go down to the end of Revelation 20, right after the judgment scene, chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, then tells us what's going to happen. Verse 14 says, Death and hell were then cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible calls it the second death in verse 14. This is the second death. Why does it call it the second death? They died once, right, in this life. If a lost person dies, that's just the first death. But then they're resurrected at the end of the thousand years. And then they have to suffer for all of their, their actions, all of their works, all of their deeds that haven't been forgiven through the blood of Jesus, through the forgiveness of Christ. And then they go into the lake of fire. That's what it says right there. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And we'll study that more in our next meeting. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, life means they, they have life, the life of Jesus, eternal life, they were cast into the lake of fire. That is a picture, a description in the Bible of the final fate of all the lost. Wow. Now, if you go down to the very next verse, then what happens is the scene changes. God goes from the fire to the new earth. Verse 1, next, next verse says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. So all of a sudden, the, sea cha the scene changes. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. For all of the other things have passed away. And go down to verse 4. I love verse 4. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And verse 5 says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Everything's going to be made new. And he said to me, Write, write these words down, for these words are true and faithful. Praise God. So God shows us the lake of fire, and then he shows us the other scene, the new earth, where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death, no more heartache, no more tears, no more bad backs, no more arthritis, no more cancer, no more strokes, no more high blood pressure. No more problems. Where do you want to be at the end of the thousand years? God shows us both sides. We have a choice. We can be in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels, or we can be in the new earth where there's no more pain, suffering, sorrow, or death. Which one? We're all going to be there, aren't we? We're all going to be there, and God shows us clearly both sides because he wants to impress us to make sure that we're on the inside of the New Jerusalem, not on the outside. Not on the outside. I heard a story once, this is actually a true story, of a physician in Chicago. He was a very famous physician. His name was Dr. Leo Winters, one of the most uh, respected physicians in the city. One night, his phone rang at 2 o'clock in the morning. He grabbed, got out of bed, grabbed the phone and said, hello, this is Dr. Winters. And the, and the voice on the other end said, Dr. Winters, there's been a terrible accident. You've got to come to the hospital right away. There's a boy that's in critical condition, and your hands are the only hands that can help this boy. Come right away. So being the physician that he was, he sprang out of bed, got into his car, and started making a beeline for the hospital. Now, he knew that time was short. This was a critical moment, and he quickly made a quick decision that the fastest way to the hospital was really to go through a very bad neighborhood, but he, he thought, I'll risk it because I've got to get there as fast as I can. So he went through this, this dangerous neighborhood. He was stopped at a stoplight, and all of a sudden, as he was waiting for the stoplight to change, his passenger door opened up. 
and a man plunged into his car with a, 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 a flannel shirt on and a gray hat. This man plunged into his car, grabbed the doctor, and said, I need your car. And he threw him out of the car. And Dr. Winters was trying to say, wait, you, you don't understand. Someone's life is at stake. Don't. But the man wouldn't listen, grabbed him, and threw him out of the car, and he drove away. So here's this doctor now, critical situation. It took him about 20 minutes to find a phone, finally found a phone, made a call, uh, got a cab to come pick him up, and, and raced into the hospital. He got there about 45 minutes late. The cab dropped him off. He ran to the nurse's station, and as he ran in there, the lady looked at him, and her, uh, her face just fell. And she said, Dr. Dr. Winters, it's too late. It's too late. The boy just died. And the doctor didn't try to explain, and then she said, uh, why don't you go down the hallway and go into the chapel because there's the, the boy's father is there and maybe you can say something to him. So Dr. Winters went down the hallway, went through these double doors, went into this little chapel, looked down on the ground in the middle of the chapel and saw on the floor, crying his eyes out, a man with a flannel shirt, a gray shirt and a flannel hat or a flannel shirt and a gray hat, crying and crying and crying because it was his his son, that was dead. And Dr. Winters looked at this man and it just hit him like a bolt. This man did not realize what he did. When he pushed out of his life, out of that car, out of his life, the only one with the hands in the whole city of Chicago that were able to save his son. And as I think about that story and I think about what we've just read in our Bibles, and this is powerful stuff, you know. This is not just an academic study we're having here. This is life or death. We're either going to be inside or outside, in the lake of fire or, or with Jesus. And as I think about that story, I think about how right now there's only one person in the whole universe who has the hands, the hands that are able to do the work and to, uh, to heal our souls. And those hands have nail scars. And those are the hands of Jesus Christ, the great physician, that right now is reaching out his hand, his arms, in love to you and to me. Everything is being recorded in the books of record, and I just hope and I pray that you will not push out of your life the one who has the hands that is able to save your soul. Invite him in. Believe in him. Trust him. Look to him. Give your whole life to him. Don't take any chances with the devil. We don't have time to fool around. Reach out, give your hand to Jesus and say, Lord, I trust you, I love you, I'm yours, I'm on your side. Save me by your grace and make sure I'm on the inside, not on the outside of the new Jerusalem at the end of the 1,000 years. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, Father, I pray for myself, I pray for everybody here, I sense your Holy Spirit here, Please help us not to follow the devil, not to be deceived by him. May our eyes be opened to Jesus and to your love. May we receive you instead of pushing you out of our lives. Please, Lord, come in, come in, forgive us, cleanse us, change us, save us by your grace. And may we all be with you forever in the new earth where there's no more pain, suffering, sorrow, or death instead of in the lake of fire. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.